Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome on this Thursday. Um, you'll see three faces on the screen. I am Rachel Peterson, um, part of Team Snow Co. And I'm here to kind of be your introductory uh, tech person for the day. Just a few reminders before we get started with Sarah and Teresa. Um, we will be this entire webinar and uh, it will be sent out on uh, to you by email and it will also be on our website. Uh, so if you need to step off or if you have some tech or audio issues and need to leave, don't worry, you'll get the recording. Um, the second thing to note is GoToWebinar has this really interesting functionality. Um, if you have any questions, and this will be interactive, so we'll be asking you um, to comment or chat, do that on the questions slash chat box that you can see on the control panel. If you don't see that, there's a little orange button that's pointing um, to the right. If you click on that, that will bring up the questions in chat. Um, we, as the organizers, can see all of your wonderful comments. Uh, other users cannot, however, but don't worry. Um, Teresa and I will be interacting with them, reading them off, sharing um, as things go on. And I mean, Jay started it off right away. He says, hi, hi. He says, hi, Sarah and Teresa. Um, so I'm going to kick it off to the lovely Teresa and Sarah for the rest of the webinar. Perfect. Thank you, Rachel. Hi, everyone. And uh, I'm coming at you live from our yellow guest bedroom, which is beautifully and perfectly on brand. I love that. I realize that. We're so excited to be with you today. Um, and thank you for those of you who joined us last week for our two webinars. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, hello and welcome. For those of you who we haven't had a chance to meet yet, I'll just take a little bit of time to talk about who we are, what we do, and to set up what we will be doing today together. So um, my name is Sarah Noel Wilson, and I'm the president of Sarah Noel Wilson Incorporated. And we are a leadership coaching and consulting company. And we're really committed to how do we help leaders build, rebuild, and most importantly, heal their teams. And you can insert relationships into that formula as well. And so all the work we do is about how can we show up more powerfully for ourselves? How can we show up more powerfully for other people? So we're super excited to be here with you today. I've invited Teresa to play a, a little bit of a unique and we're experimenting <laughs> fun role. For those of you who are like 40 and older, you'll appreciate this reference. I, I asked her, <laughs> I asked her to be the Ed McMahon to my Johnny Carson. And um, you know, and then uh, we were talking on our team and Elisa, who's a college student, was like, I don't, I don't get that <laughs> reference. Like, you know, she's the Andy Richter to my Conan. And then I just started going backwards in time. She's the Sonny to my share. And then it was just so the reason I invited Teresa is because today we are going to be talking about how do we have more meaningful conversations and typically when we are doing webinars it's very one-sided and there's some element that you just can't avoid that but i thought that to to um both give us a chance to have just more meaningful conversations and also to role model it you know one of the things that i'm particularly excited about having Teresa here is that um she has this i i talk things out loud uh, also quickly, which I'm going to work on today. And um, Teresa has this way of just listening and making these beautiful observations. And so um, she's just she's going to chime in when when she's inspired, when she you know when we feel like we need to clarify something um, or to tell a good you know jo good joke. No pressure. <laughs> um, but we're really excited about this. Um, this idea of, of how do we have more meaningful conversations is again this is part of the core work we do because everything, everything that we do is impacted by our relationships. So our success personally, professionally, is definitely impacted by the quality of our relationships. And I think we could all agree that now more than ever, these connections are almost have become sacred. Like that's how I feel. I feel like the time I have with my family, with my team, with my friends has become so sacred because we can't take them for granted anymore. And um, we heard from a number of you from our webinar last week on how to be a more empathetic leader of just wanting more specific strategies around how can I show up intentionally? So today we're really focused on like, what are some of the traps we fall into? We're going to share with you a couple of tips 
that will be valuable mindsets and practices to think about. And then most importantly, we're going to give you a very specific tool that you can use to have a different kind of conversation and to, and especially, especially in this time of disruption, right? Like how do we talk about what this new normal looks like. So we're really excited to share that with you. Um, at any point, you can ask questions. And, and like Rachel said, she and Teresa will be monitoring it. They'll be letting me know. I'm not gonna pay attention to them because my ADHD brain gets too distracted with it. So I'm gonna stay focused and present with you. Yeah, Teresa. We just had a great question come in. Can we see them? And no, we cannot. I wish we could. We cannot. I think we could all use a dose of connection, but mm. Larissa. I'm sorry. I do want to see you. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And hopefully when we, we move to a different, you know, we'll, we're looking at moving to a different platform, Zoom, that we might be able to open that up and, and to have perhaps some more intimate gathering so we can really see each other. But so you are fine in your PJs. You are fine, you know, talking to your kid or I was just, you know, making sure my dog, my dog wanted to make an appearance. So do you do you? And um but here's what I here's what I do want to invite you, right? So we can't see you, but I, I will tell you that um, I feel like we can feel you, right? We can feel your presence and your energy. And um, and so I just a couple of things. First, I just want to take a moment and I want to check in, right? I just want to check in with us from the standpoint of um, this is uh, you know, last week we talked about how this whole situation is like. Uh, an app that's running in our background, right? That we, um, that that sometimes the app is running uh, more slower, it's draining the battery a little bit. Other times it feels like it's totally crashing the system. So I just want to invite you to just take a moment and pause and check in and 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 where are you at today, right? Like one of the things we were talking about as a team before we jumped on was just how every day feels different. Um, you know, last night, yesterday, I had a really great day, was super energized and motivated during the day, was, you know, we were working on stuff, I felt good, I felt safe, I felt, felt comfortable. And then like six o'clock hit, and all of a sudden, I just became really sad. I started, you know, reading stories and um, felt like I just stared at the screen for about two hours. And, um, and so I just like, just to acknowledge the fact that, again, we know that this is like an unusual time. And so I think it's all the more important for us to just pause and check in. So here's, here's what I wanna do. I want you to think about what are the things that are currently taking space in your head in this moment? Like what are the thoughts that are taking up room? And I, I, I invite you to either write them down on a sheet of paper, if you have that, or I want you to open up a Word document Jot them down. So I'll give you just a moment now to just, you know, reflect for yourself. We're not going to ask you to share these. These are your thoughts. But just to take a moment and check in and go, what's like, what else is in the room in this moment? It's interesting, I feel like when we're on video conference, we don't allow room for silence. And there's something really beautiful about just taking that breath there, not needing to be stimulated and just being able to be present. So here's, here's what I want you to do. If you've wrote, written that down on a piece of paper, I invite you to fold it up. I don't want you to throw it away. I just want you to fold it up. If you wrote it in a Word document, I just want you to minimize it because those thoughts I just want to invite you to set them aside for the next hour, right? This is a time for us to be present in a different way, to be connected in a different way. Um, they will be there. You can pick them up. You can do whatever you need to do with them. And um, just know that you can pick them up when we're done, but that this is a really lovely time for us to just connect, to think about things in a different way, and most importantly, to pause and take a breath. You know, as leaders, we definitely, um, are constantly leading from a couple different angles. And I love this, this language, and this comes from the coactive leadership um, philosophy. And they talk about how sometimes we're leading out front, and sometimes as leaders and as parents, we're leading from the side, 
and other times we're leading from behind. And what, what we know and what certainly I've experienced through all of my years of working with people through change and navigating um, you know, the disruption in companies and in personal life is that leaders and parents often in these times are leading out front constantly. And I don't know about you, but it can be exhausting leading out front. And so I just wanna invite you that for the next like 45 minutes, Teresa and I are gonna lead out front for you. We're gonna take over, we're gonna be your lead goose. And you know, that's a term that we use. It's a term my colleague, Dr. Chris Wildermuth and I came up with is like, sometimes it's just so exhausting leading out front that we just need to tap somebody in and go, I just, I just need someone else to take lead for a moment so I can catch my breath. So this next hour, Yes, we are going to share really good content, but I also think this is just a really good time for us to sit back, to be a little bit passive, to um, be able to like sit, take in, and most importantly, take a breath. Sound good? I assume you're all doing thumbs up to me. Teresa, is there, what would you like to add um, before we jump into our content? Mm -hmm. Just welcome everybody. It's nice to be here. I'm looking forward to monitoring your comments and, and giving um, bringing those into the uh, webinar on your behalf. Um, we're all in this together. Um, every day is different, like Sarah said. So um, I'm, I'm excited because I'm, um, I feel like I'm much, uh, much happier, healthier today than I did yesterday. So I'm, I'm glad, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. Perfect. All right, so our first question we wanna check in with you. And the question is, I want you to think about what makes it difficult or what gets in your way, whether that's internal factors or external factors to have more difficult or to have more meaningful convert conversations. So what are some of the things that you get challenged with? And as you're thinking about those and sharing those, what I will share is that one of the things that makes it difficult for me to have more meaningful conversations is just the space, right? We're just moving so fast. I'm a fast talker. And so in, in the spirit of embracing that and working on that, instead of like typical webinars, and we've done this before, the comments come in and it's like a rush. Oh, Kelly said this and Jay said this and, 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 and you know, this person said this and we move so quickly. And I don't know about you, but like, I already have enough adrenaline right now. <laughs> I don't need more. So as your comments are coming in, um, uh, just know that Rachel and Teresa are reviewing those. Teresa's looking for, um, uh, for uh, themes. Rachel's looking for just some key things. I saw that somebody said I don't have chat, but you mentioned it in the question box. So if you see a question box, know that that's the same thing. It just shows up differently depending on um, like the system that you're using. So just go ahead and put it in the question box. So as these come in, as you reflect on um, for yourself, and maybe there's a nice pause, I just invite you to enjoy this breath. And for the rest of you, please share what makes it difficult for you to have meaningful conversations? So we'll just give it a moment while Rachel and Teresa review what's coming in. And, um, and then we'll just like really dig into some of these in a more meaningful way. You're right, Sarah, it's hard to pause. I'm like, oh, should I jump in? Is this yeah. enough time? <laughs> yeah, we should, We have all the time in the world. I mean, technically <laughs> we have like 50 more minutes. <laughs> There's some really, really good comments coming in. So yeah. I'm excited to give yeah. them some space. Hmm. 
So I know we have some more coming in, but I think now, now Rachel, I'll check in with you. What, what were some of the, you know, what were just some of the things that you saw rise to the surface? What were some specific? Yeah. I love this one from Jess um, and it covers a lot of reasons. Um, she says, I don't always know what to say. Um, it's difficult for me to listen. My mind tends to wander. Um, mm. I tend to want to bring it back on myself. I tend to mm. want to fix things. Um, Julianne brought up um, asking, how are you doing? Seems so insufficient right now. Um, and it's mm. also, creating the space virtually to open up just feels really challenging mm. um and Sonia brought up one that I feel like we all are fearful of is fear of a negative response mm. um and then oh Maeve also brought up for me it's generally the idea that, that there's something else I should be doing or that I don't have the emotional capacity to know what to say to open up to someone mm. It's so interesting, and Teresa, I'll come to you in a moment, but like, you know, this if this situation has taught us anything, it's taught us how much we're wired to connect, like how much we're wired to be connected to people, to be seen, to be heard, to know we add value. And, um, and yet, and yet, I don't know about you, but I mean, think about your interactions and how many interactions do you have um, where it's just surface level, right? Where you're like, I mean, I've, there were times when I used to work in an office and I would walk to the bathroom and like pass somebody and go, oh, how are you doing? And not like, I didn't really care because I wasn't pausing. I was already in the bathroom by the time they're like answering, you know, a, a question or things like that. And, you know, and one of the things that I hear a lot from my like coaching clients is just this like need to want to connect with people in more meaningful ways, but it's scary. And, it, and, you know, part of the reason why it's scary to have those more meaningful conversations is because they're risky. Right. I mean, you talk about like Brene Brown's work on vulnerability and it, that emotional courage it takes and that sometimes it's like superficial is safe. Right. But we won't build those relationships in the land of super like superficial conversations. Um, what were some of the overall themes that you you picked up, Teresa? Yeah, um, some notes I made while I was looking at everybody's comments. Um, and, and if we we could we could probably go there here in a bit. I suspect we're heading that way. But this desire to want to bring it back to yourself, mm -hmm. right? Or to listen listen um, for how to respond, bring it back to yourself. Someone said, "I like to share about myself." I think we can all relate to that, yeah. right? It's um, my favorite topic. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, a couple people mentioned not knowing how to start to start mm -hmm. or like how to ask without appearing nosy, mm -hmm. which uh, it, what right when I read that one, I could hear, um, you know, maybe my grandma's head and my face, you know, like, don't, don't ask people questions about their business, you know, like that's nosy. So like, we've got that kind of cultural idea, right, about being nosy. Um, there was a big theme of that you either get too much of a response from the other person or, or an almost nothing you know, that it was just like very polarized. Um, yeah, I, I guess too, when I was reading these and thinking, um, it made me think how much of a knee jerk thing saying, how are you doing? It's just a very knee jerk. Um, in fact, and I'll own this one is awkward. Um, I was going to a, a visitation of a woman about my age who lost her husband unexpectedly and the whole time in line I'm like I want to tell her like I'm here for you right like I, I'm just gonna hug her and say I'm here for you I'm gonna walk away and I got up there and what did I say I said how are you doing and that it wasn't it was just like a knee jerk it was like the safe response so I'm owning that one as being mm. very awkward um so which I think even when we have intentions of connecting we can revert back to um, to our habits that don't apply to the current situation here. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, I think it's interesting. I mean, I want to just like I want to acknowledge the people who said like I make it about myself. I mean, we have to understand that's that's how our brain is wired. Our brain is wired to say what's familiar about you, so I can. It's actually like 
bringing it about ourselves is a way for us in a weird way to connect with people. Because what the brain does is that, you know, when Teresa mentioned about her grandma, my brain immediately went to thinking about my grandma's, right? And the problem is, or the challenge is, the opportunity we have is to make sure we don't stay in our story, right? Because part of that is to say, oh yeah, I've had that experience too. Now we're familiar. Now I, I trust you a little bit more. It becomes problematic when we stay in our, our I call it my, our, our land. Like if I stay in my land and I just stay in my story, then I never get to hear about her story and I never go back to it, right? So there's nothing, there's nothing wrong. And that is just a biological, like psychological way we actually process things, make meaning and connect with people. One of the practices is to make sure that we don't stay in our story and we move back to their story. And you, you, you'll notice that like, use this webinar as an opportunity. When we tell stories or share things, notice when you're like, oh yeah, I've got a grandma. Now I'm thinking about grandma Alice. Now I'm thinking about grandma Kohler, now, you know, or whatever the case is and like, oh, there she is. Acknowledge it, bring it right back. Um, the other thing is just like the mind wandering. You know, we we have on average like 70,000 thoughts a day. On average, that means some of us are way over that and some people are slightly less. Um, we take in something, I forget what the stat is, it's like seven or 11 million bits of information every second. It's ridiculous, right? And so like your mind is going to wander. The cool thing is, is that learning how to listen, to connect, listen, to understand, listen, to learn, is that it's a muscle we can build. It's a very like simple muscle. And I'll tell you, the first practice is simply to notice my story bring it back to their story. My story, bring it back to their story. That is how we start to rewire our brain to hold focus in a different way. Um, and then like just the fears, right? Like I think that again, that's that's normal and natural. And, um, and the fear of, I know some people said like, will they, uh, you know, like think I'm prying or will, will I be misunderstood or will I be judged or all of those? Like those are again, perfectly human emotions because we are wired to want to be in tribes so that we can live and survive and if 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 you're going to judge me that makes me feel like i'm i'm might not be as safe because i'll be outside of the tribe so beautiful thank you all for sharing that and realize like how um how common this is i think that um and you know this makes me think i was working with a group um it was like an agribusiness group they may be on the line um, <laughs> And we were doing work on coaching and coaching is all about how do we listen differently? How do we ask questions differently? And one of the participants at the end of all of the session, I'll never forget, it was such a like heartwarming moment. He said, um, and when I said, what surprised you about like this work we did today? And he goes, and you could tell, it was like, well, almost like he didn't want to say it. I was like, things got real personal, you know, almost like looking around the room, like, is it okay for him to share this? Is it not? And so then I asked him like, well, so what do you think of that? How was that? And I'll never forget it. He goes, it was kind of nice. You know, and I think that that's true for all of us. Like, again, like we, we wanna move past the surface level, we just don't know how to. So beautiful, thank you. And we will give you some really specific tips of how to, to navigate that. So the first place that um, I wanna jump into is just traps. And one of the traps we have is that when we show up in relationships, in our conversations, we use essentially the wrong conversation style. And I'll explain what this is. So this um, framework comes from the work of Judith E. Glazer, who is my dear, um, dear teacher, um, who um, really pioneered how do we look at the neuroscience of trust differently? And she um, passed on, so like she's in my heart right now. Um, but so she explains that all conversations fall into one of three types of categories, right? So the first one is we have conversations that are very transactional. They're very sort of telling, asking, it's very one-sided, right? We just had groceries delivered. He's coming up to the door and I'm telling him, put him on the outside. It was very transactional. And, and I wanna be clear, like there's not a wrong style it's just what is right for the relationship and what is right for the moment, the situation. So in transactional, we're more focused on like what's important to me. Um, this is where we're confirming what we know. Um, we might be sharing information, but again, like it's more from a transactional perspective. A healthy transactional conversation is one where we're exchanging information, right? Kind of like we're doing now. There's some elements of this that will be very transactional. Like me just explaining about transactional is transactional. But our hope is to have some moments of transformation. Um, unhealthy, though, is when we get into the, the telling, selling, yelling mode, right? Like, and we become very one-sided, very I'm right, you're wrong, 
you need to do it my way. So that's the first type of conversation. And as I go through these, I want you to pay attention to what are, you know, what are ones that are most common for you? Maybe what are traps you fall into? So the next one is positional. And positional is when we're advocating, we're inquiring, right? This is where we're sharing information, but it's with the intention to like either in a healthy way, collaborate and, you know, and build something together in a potentially unhealthy, right? Like we're really just like, again, sort of similar to trans transactional focused on our like point of view, right? So positional is, um, you know, we are, we're having some issues with uh, Zoom. And we're gonna have a very positional conversation where we will be advocating for what we need. We will be inquiring about what the challenges are, but ultimately we're trying to get a solution. So that's the second conversation type. And the third one is transformational, right? And transformational is where we are discovering and sharing together. And, and again, I wanna be very clear that there's not a wrong type. It's not like to have meaningful conversations, they all need to be transformational or to have like good relationships but that what does the relationship need right now? What does the moment call for? And can we be intentional enough to notice that? You know, I think that Teresa, to go back to your story that I think we can all relate to, cause you're just like, what do I even say? I know that your life has just been like up, like completely upended and, and the pain is so deep. There's nothing I can say. And so sometimes in those moments we'll tend to like fall back on a more transactional habit right? Because it's comfortable, it's safe, it's what we know. And when we think about having these meaningful conversations, again, we need to look at what does the situation and what does the relationship need in this moment? And, um, you know, and a good example of this is, you know, just last night, I, you know, when I was mentioning that I just was having a tough night, my heart felt very heavy um, for, for, for people, for myself, for my family. And I reached out just, I mean, on Twitter, I have a good Twitter friend, Laura, who's from New York. And, um, and I just shared with her, I was like, my heart feels really heavy. And, and again, this is all taking place in text. So when we talk about transformational sharing and discovering, that doesn't have to happen verbally, right? There's ways we can connect in really meaningful ways. And she said, you know, that's so interesting. Like, I just found myself crying tonight. And we just had this beautiful, like, connection and commitment like and conversation through text because we are sharing and discovering because it's what the conversation it's what the situation it's what the relationship needed and we had like this beautiful like she brought up this beautiful awareness of around like interesting how we're okay to cry for other people but it's harder for us to cry for ourselves and like and that's all just text right and it's just because if she showed up in a more transformative way i showed up in a more transformative way and um, so that's one of the ways to think about, right? That like, what, when do we get pulled into that transactional? Um, you know, imagine that if I, I don't know, if I sent that message to another person and their response was like, well, you don't have to worry about anything. I mean, like you and Nick are fine, right? Like that, like that becomes almost like positional, argumentative, almost transactional. And that's not what the relationship needed. So I just want to introduce these traps we fall into is like we, 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 we tend to fall into transactional because it's safe. We, we fall into it because we're a little addicted to being right. And that when we want to create these meaningful relationships, it's about really intentionally going, how do we discover and share together in a way that feels different than, than other situations? Um, you know, it, and, and I'll, I'll use another example. And again, like here's a different way of sharing and connecting. My good friend, Corey Han, who's out in um, uh, Seattle, he saw my post about just like struggling and he sent me just the sweetest message. He said, I don't have wisdom because like things are like so messy right now. But he knows that my husband and I are big Royals fans. He said, but I thought you might enjoy seeing my favorite Royals baseball card as I go through my connections. And it was just this like beautiful moment of like acknowledging what was needed from the relationship, right? And um, yeah, so one of the traps we fall into is we show up with the wrong conversation style for what the relationship and the situation needs. And I'll pause there to just see, Teresa, if you have any thoughts that you would like to add or expand on this concept. I think one thing we hear from, from groups um, or to echo what you hear from individuals, Sarah, is just that pausing to think what the need is right now, right? I think it's hard to overstate how important that is. Um, and their need. Yes, yeah, like, right. And their need. Yeah. 
and the relationship need, not just your need. Like your need might be efficiency and effectiveness. Their need is to be heard. Thank you. No, beautiful. So um, the next trap that we fall into is, and somebody even mentioned this when they talked about what gets in your way. And we talked about this last week related to like, what are like, what gets in our way? What are the barriers to empathetic leadership? Is that we try to solve every damn problem. That when somebody comes to you in pain, if somebody comes to you struggling, if somebody comes to you confused, if somebody comes to you that we move right into, what can I do to fix it? right? What are, the, what are the things I can do to fix it right now? And, and some of this is just how we're wired. Because again, like our brain's job is to protect us. It's to keep us alive. Like that's its number one job. It's not to make us happy. It's not to, you know, like it is to keep us alive. And if I can solve problems, right? Like that ensures that I'm more likely to like hang around a few more days, right? And, but I want to, I want to talk through four things that I've reasons that I've seen, especially lately, that are really driving this like need to problem solve. And as I share them, I want you to think about like, which ones are true for you, right? I mean, I know that there are times where it's like, yeah, I just even had a call with Elisa this morning. And I was like, so what can I do? And I was like, nope, 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 nope. I'm going to eat those words because I don't need to solve this. Like, this is us like to figure out together. This isn't even something for us to solve. And yet I'm making it a problem. So here's, here's some reasons why we fix. One of the things that I'm seeing a lot lately, and part of it is, again, it comes from like a, a, like a natural instinct is that things are uncertain and things are uncertain at work. And we know that there are companies who are laying people off or may have to, like that is a reality. That is not an, an un unrealistic fear or concern. And so I'm seeing this sort of like hyper move to what can I do to add value? How do I make sure I add value? And so what's happening is like people are jumping in and wanting to fix it and wanting to prove themselves. So that's one thing that I've been seeing increase that's a little bit different than before this um, all happened. The other, the other one that I'm seeing a lot really rise up is that because everything externally feels so out of control, it feels so out of control that it's like we're desperate for some amount of control. And the way that we're going to control that is by like fixing things and taking your problems on and being active and doing things like that. And so, um, and so recognize that this like this is where we're seeing a lot of like hyper micromanaging happening that it's not about people working virtually. I mean, maybe, but I think like when, when leaders are saying like, I just don't know how to keep track of what they're doing. I don't know, you know, like, how do I make sure they're doing their work? Like my suspicion is that this need to control, especially right now, actually has nothing to do with, do you think they're doing it or not? I think it's at a deeper level that we feel so out of control in other parts of our life that we're trying to cling to the things that we need to. The other thing that um, I want to just acknowledge is that there's internal rewards. I love having somebody go, that's a great idea, Sarah. And my ego's like, bing, thanks. You know, or that's a great question, Sarah. Bing, thanks, right? Um, that there's internal, we do, we get hits of dopamine and serotonin, and it feels good to help people, and it feels good to solve their problems. We also have to acknowledge the fact that, especially as leaders, that means you have moved up in your career. You know, most of you are guessing are probably like mid-career. And so you have been rewarded for what you know and how you can solve problems, right? Like this is the, somebody I think just shared like the, I must fix, fix this instinct, right? Um, yeah, and so we've been rewarded for that. And that's a challenge when we move into leadership because like, it's not about us solving everyone's problems, it's about us helping them solve their problems. So for those of you who have the like, I must fix it instinct that Joe shared, um, there's nothing wrong with you, you're human, um, but it's an opportunity for us to pay attention to because it, you know, it's like when we talk about meaningful conversations, especially now, right? That sometimes you get on a call with somebody and you can just tell. You can tell that this is a heavy day. You can tell that this is a tired day. You can tell that this is a moment where they want nothing more than to send their kids to school and not have to deal with them for a couple of hours, right? Like we can feel it. And, and when somebody comes to us with that kind of um, emotional uh, energy, right? Like we want to solve it for them because we're good people and we want to take away, away, you know, away their pain. Sometimes though, we have to catch the fact that sometimes we want to solve their emotional problem because it's actually making us uncomfortable. 
that like I'm trying to remove your pain because it's actually making me quite uncomfortable. And so just to notice that trap we fall into of like, so why, why do I feel the need to fix this right now? And, you know, I'll use an example. I mean, again, like I'm, I mean, so I'm a professional coach. I've been coaching for uh, so many years now that my brain is sort of just automatically wired now to get curious, to ask questions, to explore things with people. And when my family, you know, or my husband, Nick is struggling with something, my default is like, oh yeah, let's dig in. And what can I do to, you know, help you? But that's not what they need. And so one of the ways that I work through this is I've gotten better about saying, do you just need to vent? Do you just need me to listen? Or are you curious about how I might approach it if I was working with you? And like, that's a way for us to catch that need to fix is to just put it out there. Is that what they want? Because people will tell you, I do. I just don't know how to approach this. And also people will tell you I'm good. I just need to talk through this right now, right? Like I'm just struggling right now and I don't need you to solve it. I just need to like talk it out. So that's like a quick way we can overcome that trap is by ensuring that we at least pause and say, what do you need right now so that I can help you in this moment? What thoughts do you have, Teresa, as I, or anything you would like to add? I'm gonna step off screen for a moment. Yeah, no, you're fine. Um, well, I took it back to me for a minute. Now I'm going to bring it back because I live with someone who's a fixer and, um, and there are times I value that and there are times I don't, it's not necessary. And I think that's a really good insight for all of us. It's like, are we, is our response serving us or is our response serving the person? Right. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a key idea. And also shout out to Joe Van Hackey. <laughs> yeah. Gotta love uh, Joe. I, you know, I think that, I think that that's a really good moment of pause of like, you know, building that self-awareness to catch the need to fix it. Well, ha and here's a couple key words that you'll hear. Well, you should, well, have you tried? Well, what about this? The other thing that's interesting is like when somebody's sharing a problem, it's possible they've already tried a bunch of stuff. And this is, this is when, you know, I, I have moments where it's like, I've already done 10 steps and I'm still stuck. And so it's like when somebody just jumps right into, well, have you tried this? Yep. What about this? Sure have. And this? Yep. You know, and like, almost like I can get irritated because they haven't stopped to say, well, what have you tried? So if you feel that need to fix two things, stop and ask them, is that what they need? Right. And second, if they say yes, make sure you like get curious about, well, what have they already done or what have they tried? So hopefully that Sarah. makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Joe also had a really great suggestion because we all have ample time to watch movies right now mm. and learn. Um, the Pixar Great Inside Out, which everyone mm. loves, shows us great examples of how to listen rather than to fix. And that's a great movie you can watch with kids and do yeah. learn something as an adult. Yeah, for sure. All right, so moving right along. It's always funny how I always think like, oh, we've got like 20 minutes of content and then it's like, nope, we need to, <laughs> gotta move. All right, so here's our tip. Don't fix, just listen. Just, just shut up. Just literally don't say anything, you know, which will feel so uncomfortable. Like, um, you know, it's there's a really great children's book and we'll sh I'll, I'll make sure that Rachel shares it when we send out the email. There's a great children's book by a, an author up in Minneapolis, and it's called The Rabbit Listened. And it's this beautiful story about a little boy who's heartbroken because his sculpture that he made crashed and how all the animals try to do all these things to cheer him up. And then ultimately it was the rabbit who just listened and helped him. So like, this is a great concept to explore with your kids as well. And so, um, so, you know, when we talk about this, like, you know, some people said, I, like, I don't know how to deal with the emotions when they come up. You know, when we were talking about like, what are the topics we can explore that would be really meaningful? Somebody on our team said, I feel like leaders are doing a much better job of asking, how are you? But then they aren't prepared for what comes up on the backside. Like they aren't prepared for the strong emotions. They aren't prepared for it. And so I just want to give you a couple of like really specific things you can say in those moments, like, thank you for sharing that with me. I can see that this is hard right now, right? Don't need to solve it, but just like, just acknowledging their vulnerability 
um, is a really powerful place to start. So if you say like, hey, how's it going? Like, it's a madhouse. I'm exhausted. Last night I was crying. I, you know, like couldn't even make dinner, whatever the case is like, like, thank you for sharing that with me. And just giving it a beat because what you're doing is you're letting that person know they're being seen and heard, right? And that, that their emotions are safe with you. Sometimes I will say that with people. So just so you know, whatever comes up is safe with me. You know, like this space is whatever needs to come up. And, um, <clears throat> and, and, and to acknowledge, right? Like that's hard. Teresa, she'll do that. Like she'll, she'll say that a lot, like that's hard. Like just to acknowledge it, like that's tough. I can see how tough this is for you. Because again, sometimes people just want to be acknowledged in their emotions and to be, you know, to know that it's okay. What other tips might you add, Teresa, related to just like, you know, don't fix, just listen? Um, sometimes when I don't know what to say, I just go, mm. Mm. you know, just hold some space, give some type of acknowledgement, right? Just um if you can tell the person wants to say more, I think it's okay to say, keep going. Yeah. Like, is, is there more? Less is more sometimes in this, in this part of the conversation. Yeah, totally. Like even just saying like, tell me more, like say more, you know, what else is going on? Um, uh, Michael, uh, Michael, uh, I'm going to butcher his name, Bungay Stainer wrote a really great book called The Coaching Habit and he calls it the awe question, A-W-E. And what else? And I love that so much. And I know that, um, you know, again, we talked about this last week, but just to remember that when we're listening, we listen from a place of what does this mean to me? And when we're, you know, trying to show up in more meaningful ways, we need to listen for what this means to them. I can hear that this is important to you. I can see how much you're struggling with this. Um, and that might be a practice we'll dig into in a future webinar as well. The second tip related to how we can show up is to just ask questions, but to ask questions for them. And I want to give you an example of this, right? Like asking questions for them to be able to explore, for them to be able to like increase their self-awareness. Um, you know, a lot of times we'll, and, and, and I'm very pro-curiosity, right? Like we know that that's my, you know, chronically curious. And curiosity, like asking questions, increasing your knowledge, great, so great. And I'm not saying it's wrong, but when we're in these moments where maybe emotions are high, let's ask questions for them. And so uh, I think I have a slide on this, so bear with me. Yeah, so here's some questions we can think about, especially, so these are questions specific to just right now. Ask your team, you can have a team conversation or you can ask people one-on-one, -on -one, what is harder now than before? I have to give a shout out to um, my good friend and speaker, uh, Rachel Sheeran. She shared with me a really great resource and these were two questions on it. I thought it was really provocative. And I've been using it a lot with myself and my clients. And it's just opened up just this depth of conversations. What is harder now than before all this happened? And then to make sure we're always looking at like expanding the peripheral. So we aren't just focusing on the negative or the frustration, but also like what's gotten easier, right? What have we learned in this moment? I think that, um, you know, a question like what has surprised you working from home? Again, just to like go deeper than just how are you? But just like, what are you learning about yourself? People will surprise you because they'll go, this is what will happen. We're so used to superficial, like surface level questions that when you ask a question for them, they will almost always have this moment of like whiplash, like, oh, oh that's a good question. And then they will give you something amazing. And then guess what? You just get to listen to it and get curious about it and hold space for whatever comes up, right? And then, and it's not to say that you can't share what you're learning, right? But again, it's this dance. A conversation should be a dance. It's, it's not, a, it's not a monologue. It's a dialogue. Um, I also think it's really important to ask the question, like, what are you proud of right now? Especially when things are a struggle, it can be easy to forget. Like, there are things that we're adapting to, adjusting to. If you think about this with a team, you could ask, like, what are we really proud of accomplishing during this time? So I want to ask you that. I want to ask the audience this question. When you think about where you're at, like, what are you proud of um, that you've either done differently, that you've adapted, that you're thinking differently? Um, and I just want to, I want to, we want to celebrate you in the questions in the chat. So go ahead and just take a moment and reflect on like, what are you proud of doing?
Do we have some coming in? Yes, we do. Some beautiful, beautiful things. <clears throat> I'll let Rachel call out these specifics, but a lot of people are celebrating like human adaptability. Mm. You know, how gloriously adaptable humans are by different things they've changed on the fly or are going with. Um, so I'll let Rachel call out some of these specifics, but that's that's a big celebration for humanity mm. right now, I think. Mm. This one I really love, shout out to Carrie. Um, she says, I'm proud that I'm running with my 12 year old daughter um, over our lunch. She was supposed to be on the track team. I definitely mm. treasure this as the weather gets warmer um, and we get to have time that we wouldn't usually have together. I love that. Um, uh, Amy says, home cooking is a chronic out to eat gal and now I cook almost mm. every day. Fun to be creative in this way. <laughs> I'm on that team with you, Amy. Um, I can't find the uh, name now, but it was um, staying, staying centered despite um, a lot of things being out of my control. Mm -hmm. um, Sarah says, showing my team how to remain calm and focused. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people, sorry, Teresa, I'm going to step on your toes. A lot of people are just saying about practicing gratitude, building mm -hmm. in um, a gratitude practice into their, into their daily life and, and uh, really noticing the small moments. I love that. And like, that's such a beautiful practice too, when you talk about developing more meaningful conversations with your team members or your spouse or your kids, it's just, again, like going, going a little bit deeper. We, um, I don't know if my parents are watching, they might, but like one of the things we're going to do to like work on this since we don't get time with them is I'm going to invite them on a dinner date this weekend. So I had food sent to them that will be the same food we will make. And I just want us to ask questions of each other. Like now is the time for us to connect in a more meaningful way. I mean, we have the time, but also like, we also don't know how much time we have. And so like to be really thoughtful about like, how do we make sure that every conversation isn't necessarily about the news or what's happening, but like, how can we stay connected? Um, beautiful. So just think about what are questions you can ask for them, right? For them to, to learn, for them to go deeper, for them to share something maybe they haven't they haven't shared before. So those are just a few you can think about asking your team or people today. Now where I wanna end, oh, this is a quote, and I shared this quote, but I think it is such a good quote to share again for those of you who are new and were on last week. And that is just to remind ourselves that a loving silence often has more power to heal and connect than most intended words. And I will tell you, silence can be really uncomfortable. Um, I, I mentioned about the, the, the Rapid That Listen book right? Um, I had it at an event a couple weeks ago because I was giving it to Kristen on our team because she's just had a baby. Yay, Kristen! Yay, baby Mason! And, um, and my good friend Renee Hardman was like, I want to read this book. So literally the event's over. We've been there like all night. So it's just her and I sitting at this table that they're cleaning up and she starts reading it. She starts reading it out loud. And Renee is such a beautifully, like deeply emotional person. And I love this about her. And um, as she's reading it, when she gets to the section about the rabbit listens, she starts getting quite emotional about it. And I, I will tell you, like, I, I cried every time I read this book. And, and, um, and like, there was a little bit of my instinct to be like, oh, it's okay. And then I was like, nope, I'm just going to put my hand on her back. And I'm just going to be with her in this moment. I didn't, and, and neither her or I said anything for like a full minute. And I never felt like it was such a beautiful, deep connection to just be present with somebody. All right, okay, so now where I wanna do in our last minutes together, I wanna give you a really specific framework, um, like an exercise that you can do with your team to talk about this new normal, right? We know that, we know that there, like, there's no going back to normal. Like, we are all changed, our things will be changed, we don't know how things are going to be changed, but we, we know for sure that this is a new normal. And one of the ways we can have meaningful conversations is to talk about that and to explore that and, and not to hide it. It's the elephant in the room that we all can see. 
So let's talk about it. So I wanna share with you this really specific um, exercise you can do. I learned this back when I was working at ROG and I can't tell you, I can't remember who taught it to me. I always like to give credit to people. I just can't remember. I didn't create it. So just know that, like I didn't create it and passing it along. But in any situation where there's change, um, we fall on these two continuums, right? So when we're going through a situation of change, like we all are now, there on one end of the spectrum, there are things that we don't want to have happened in the new normal. And there are things we do want, right? Like I want to be able to still be productive. I don't want to be stressed every day, for example. Then there's a continuum of things I have currently, and there are things I don't have currently, right? So for example, there are things that I have and I still want. I um, Connection to my team. I still want that, even if it has to happen virtually. There are things that I have and I don't want um, that I'm like, I want to get rid of. And for me, those are like 12, 14 hour days. I have that. I don't want that anymore. So how do I trash that? So, and actually I'll show this next slide, which will explain it a little bit better. So each of these quadrants uh, has a different name to it, right? So things that we have and things that we want, we call those treasures, right? So for, for me, if I were thinking about the team, I treasure the time that I get with them. I treasure the time when we get to brainstorm. Um, I treasure the time that Nick and I can go for walks. I have that and I still want it. Again, things that I don't want and I have are trash. You might explore this with your team and they may say like, uh, can we get rid of the like eight hours of meetings every day? <laughs> can we get rid of like some of the bureaucratic stuff because it's just slowing us down, right? So I'll explain how you can use this. So I'll walk through the model first. So then there are things we don't want and we don't have and those are fears, right? Like when I think about um, this time, things that I don't want is, um, I don't want to be in a situation where I have to like reduce hours or reduce staff and I don't have to now. So like, that's a fear of mine, right? Um, somebody might say, I don't, um, I don't want to feel disconnected and I like, and we feel connected now and like, that's a fear. Then the other side is things that people want, but they don't have, we call those wishes. So this is a really beautiful framework that you can use as an activity with a team or an activity with just, or even just a conversation. And I'll talk about what this looks like if you do it with your team. And again, I'll use the example, you can use any kind of change situation, but you can use, if you use this example of now working virtually or not working as like closely or working in different ways, you could have like an hour meeting and just explore this. Like what are the things like and brainstorm, right? You can use a collaboration tool where people can collaborate on the same screen together and kind of put up virtual sticky notes and first have them think about what are the things you have that we have now as a team that we just don't want in this new, like we have this disruption, let's use it to like shed some of the things that aren't effective. Um, you know, one of the things that we've explored is we have a lot of manual processes. And now we have the time to automate some stuff. So we're like, we're doing manual stuff. We don't want to trash. Like, let's figure out how to automate it. And then you can have them think about like, what are some of the things we currently have and um, we still want? And we can identify that. And then you can spend time on fears. What are things we don't want, we don't have? And you can see how this can like emerge some really deep things, some feelings, some thoughts that people have that they might not share normally. Um, because they haven't been asked, because this, the space hasn't been safe for that. Um, and then finally, and so this is really important, always end on wishes. We always want to end on a positive of like, what do you want? Like, what do we not have and what do we want? And, um, and so you could have this conversation with your team, which will have a really meaningful conversation about this. So instead of just like, well, what are we going to do? Um, invite them to explore these different categories. And then, and then what's beautiful for those of you who like action, you can come up with some really powerful actions from this. Okay, like we're gonna let go of, of two hour meetings. We're gonna have 30, you know, like we've, we've moved from meeting all day Monday to having a, like a, a two hour touch base on Monday. We have a 30 minute, just like, hey, where are we at with things? And then we have an hour meeting at the end of the week, right? Like those are things we've adjusted um, if we think of it through this lens. And so um, I know that, you know, uh, Teresa actually did this exercise with an organization where they were losing a leader that they was very beloved. And, um, and some of the things that emerged were so 
powerful. And I don't know, I know Teresa, we're running a little shorter in time, but just to take a few minutes about what was that experience like for you facilitating this with the team? And then I'll share with you feedback I just heard yesterday on the exercise. Um, I would say that this was fun for the group. It brought the group together. Um, one thing I heard um, and, and was beautiful for them were so many people in the group had the same wishes. Hmm. And, and I don't think that they had really shared those out loud before. So that gave them something to um, anchor on to like, oh, I had no idea. Um, so many of us thought that this was a wish. So maybe we could do something about that. Um, you know, spoiler for anyone who's going to facilitate this, um, I think the groups that are most successful um, come out of this with a sense of what's more in their control, what they have more, um, I'm using the word power in a, in a good way, right? Um, what they have power to control and make happen. Um, because especially, I mean, often on teams or at work, um, and especially now, it's, there's always um, the potential for feelings of powerlessness, you know, helplessness. So I think that's um, I think I think that's extremely important right now, and we could definitely you know be worked through um, this exercise. And then the other thought I had was um, oh oh did I lose my thought? No, there it came back. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the other thought I had was related to um, being okay to let some things go. Something that came up on this team, um, I'm thinking of specifically, was they had had a lot of baggage from several years ago um, that they didn't realize was still in the room until they worked through because it, it manifested in the fears. Mm -hmm. And then bonus points to the group who can take um, who can take fears and and operationalize them to prevent them from happening. Mm -hmm. I love that. What I will tell you is I was just talking to the, the, the leader yesterday and the new leader who replaced the leader who was outgoing was like, this is single-handedly the like one of the best pieces of data for a new leader coming in because I already know what their fears are, what their wishes are. And I, and I want to just echo that like sense of control and giving back and power. When we're leading through times of change, again, we want to fix everything and we feel like we have to take it all on. Um, one of the most powerful ways to... Uh, uh, what do I want to say, activate your company to develop their adaptive skills is to give the work back to the people. This is a concept from Ronald Heifetz and Marty Linsky and their work on adaptive leadership is they, we have to think about how do we give the work back to the people? How do we help them think through it? How do we help them like explore it? I was working with a client recently and, you know, she was thinking through all the things like, oh, I've got to like, got to think about this and what are best practices of working from home and how do we stay more connected? And, you know, I just sort of paused and was like, what, what do you think would be possible if you open that conversation up from your head to their heads? And they had this amazing brainstorm. And like, and a couple of things I want to say is that when you give work back to the people, um, a couple of things happen. You know, like uh, Teresa was saying, they, they feel more in control. But we also know that people are more likely to commit to things they help create. That if their thumbprint is on it, they are more likely to get on board with it that versus you just telling them. So this is like, just like kind of a bonus thing. <laughs> if you wanna increase engagement and commitment, involve them, right? The other thing I will say is when people feel involved, included and acknowledged, that actually is shown to reduce the level of stress because they're a part of it, they're valued, they're, um, again, they're like able to have some control over the situation. So when, if you are having teams that are like really spiking, do an exercise like this and then take some actions. And this is something you can do as a family. You can say, hey, like, we're stuck together now. What's our, like, what do we wanna let go of? What do we wanna hold on to? What's our fears? And what, what are some wishes that we can create? So I hope that this is, um, has been valuable for you because it's such a simple, but such a powerful exercise that you can do again as a group setting, or you can even just one-on-one, -on -one, like when you're talking to people, like what are some of the things you think we should let go of? What are some of the things you think we should add? What's like a worry you have? The other thing that will happen with this, and, and I've done this with groups, um, like I did it at my last company, we did it with a whole company, so almost 200 people in like mini sessions about moving. And what we found is that sometimes the things that we like were afraid of were in conflict with what we wanted. 
You know, and an example of that is, and again, this is how we can have these meaningful conversations that might produce conflict or resentment. Like, nope, they're getting out the window because we're talking about them. That one of the fears was um, in the new building, the new space would be a loss of privacy, right? One of the wishes was having more sunlight and more windows throughout the whole building. Well, guess what? In order to have more sunlight, we need to reduce the walls, which means we're gonna lose a little bit of privacy. So it opened up this beautiful conversation around like, sometimes we gotta like give a little to get a little, right? Like sometimes, and it, it amplified that. So I wanna be conscious of time because I know we're at 201. And um, so I know some of you have to drop off. So please thank you for attending. Um, take a moment to, uh, you know, I think there's a question set up on the backside of what was valuable, what else would you wanna see? That's really important for us. Um, we will hang on just for like another five minutes or so. Um, uh, just if there's any questions that we can answer, we'll keep this recording. For those of you who have to bounce off, you can go back and see it. But just a quick note of how we can stay connected. Please connect with us on social media. Connect with and follow me on Twitter. Connect with us on LinkedIn and Facebook. Um, also, you can go to our website. We have a weekly newsletter where we just, you know, we share topics related to personal and professional development. And so we would love to have you join our newsletter community. That is an incredible community. And um, if there are any questions, we're happy to answer. Even if you have to bounce off, just ask the question and I'll just talk to myself <laughs> and you can answer it and you can come back and watch it later. So um, with that, for those of you who are bouncing off, Thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much for wanting to dig deeper into your conversations um, and your relationships. I promise you, your world will be better for it. So um, I'll just, we can hang on for a couple more minutes if there are any questions. And if not, we'll just stare at each other lovingly. Uh, we have a question from Sonia. She says, when will the recording be available? I'd love mm. some of my coworkers to view it. Sonia, I will be getting um, the recording up by this evening and you will also get a separate email with the recording um, and Sarah's slide deck so you can yeah. share away. And that the recording links to our YouTube site. Um, so all you have to do is send out the YouTube link to your colleagues. Yep, share away. This world needs more meaningfulness. So this world needs more Sarah. <laughs> Just needs more heart. That's what we're trying to produce. Just a little bit more heart. Good. Well, if there's questions that come up, what we will do is we'll we'll, ha we'll hang out as people are dropping off. So if you want to drop us a message in the question. Uh, box. We would love to hear it just to give us a sense of what was valuable for you. And then um, we'll keep you posted as we put together new webinars. We're working on those, but also trying to be conscious of managing our own energy. And so we may take next week off and then come back the following week. So um, everyone stay safe, be well, give yourself grace and space and give that to other people and know that we, um, I believe in the L word. So I love you all and thank you for joining us. Sarah, we had a good one come in by oh, someone yeah. still on, and um, I'm going to share it, and then I need to be outside for a teacher sure. yeah, break. Teacher, teacher break. So, I know, we're very excited. Um, someone's asking if you have recommendations on how to engage a supervisor who admits he's not good with feelings. Mm, good. Okay. That's, I like that you're going to jump off on that one. Yeah. Like, Let me here. just toss this one in and got to go. <laughs> Uh, that's, you you no, got that's it. Good. You'll be great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Teresa. Love yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Bye. Thanks. <laughs> Gotta go. <laughs> so for the question of like, how do you talk to somebody like that? One, it's, you know, I think that that's a huge opening when somebody shares with you, like, I'm just not good with the feelings things, right? Like, no, it's different if they're like, I'm throwing that up there so I don't have to do it. And they're like bouncing away from it. It's another thing. It's like, you never know that might be a little cry for like some support and help and um so I, so i wonder if you have that opportunity a couple of things one if it comes up again you can ask them or just talk to them and say like um what would you like what you know if you can move the needle on one thing right this is a beautiful coaching opportunity and you can coach up uh, my team does it all the time and i love it <laughs> sarah i invite you to think about this um but to think about like if you can move the needle um 
uh, related to showing up more emotionally or more expressive or more empathetically or whatever language you want to use that will be meaningful for them. Um, just ask that, like, what would that look like? And how can I support you in this? I think sometimes we think that like, we hold leaders up on these pedestals that they're all knowing and they've got all their shit figured out, so to speak, but really I think they're just people who maybe have a little bit different experience and they need support too. And so I think there's something really powerful as a team member to say like, how can I support you in this? The other thing is like, it would be interesting to explore with them like, um, what I might ask is, you know, what do you think would be possible? Like what else, like what more could we do as a team if that was an area you were able to expand in? And not in an accusatory way, but a genuinely like curious way. Um, here's the thing, we are, uh, we are emotional. Like I always love it when people go, uh, I don't, yeah, I'm not a very emotional person. And my smart, smart aleck response is always, well, which ones don't you feel? Do you not feel anger? Oh no, you feel anger, okay. Do you not feel shame? Oh no, you feel shame. Do you not feel joy? Oh no, you feel joy. So what we have to understand though is society, um, especially again, I'll call out my, my, my men here, uh, society isn't good or kind to you being emotional. And so we build up these habits. In fact, this is something that, um, we all we all have this resistance to showing emotions. Like think about it, when somebody cries, what do they do? They apologize for it. They apologize for something that is as, as natural as breathing because we've been told that it's shameful, we've been told that it's weak. And I don't know about you, but anytime I've tried to hold back the floodgates, it always feels worse. And the minute they get released, like last night, I just said, forget it. I'm just gonna sit here and cry. I'm, the webinar can wait. Humanity is on my heart and I'm just gonna let the tears go. And guess what, I felt better afterwards. So I think just to recognize that like, we all are capable of empathy. We are all capable of, of expressing emotions. We've just been sort of beaten out of us, depending on our situation, our culture, how we are raised, what's expected of us. Um, I think the other thing related to this question from the standpoint of like how to support your leader um, is maybe to even come from a place of like, um, if you have moments when they were more connected emotionally or empathetically and to, and to remind them of times when they have and why you appreciated that. Like, I hear that that's hard for you. You know, I will share with you, like, I really appreciated when my mom was sick, how you gave me the flexibility, right? And so just to let you know, like, when you show up in a way of acknowledging just our human experience, it actually makes you a better leader. I think sometimes people are scared of that. So I hope that that answers that question or at least gives you some things to think about. Rachel, is there anything else that's come in? It looks like we have a few people hanging on. This is like uh, yeah. you know, after dark. This is the- yeah. Ooh, <laughs> what's gonna come up? Show. Not after dark, <laughs> that's horrible. Yeah. Uh, no, we have not had any uh, okay. other questions come in. Okay, perfect. Well, everyone, thank you again so much. And I mean it so deeply from the bottom of my heart that um, you, we are on this ride together and that having meaningful connections isn't just for now, it's for always. And hopefully this gives you some practices of how you can show up more powerfully for the people in your life because they certainly deserve it. All right, I'm gonna be officially out now. So take care everyone.